So I'm going to run through some of the um, examples and the thinking. So it's a great segue into from, uh, from conceptual framework, maybe wisdom, to actual stories, examples of how we do data science in the clinical informatics domain. And uh, so this is a mandatory slide. There's no conflict uh, with um, the content I'm going to tell you, deliver. And you already have seen it. We are drawn in data, right? And uh, this is one way to estimate how, how big uh, data it is, uh, one way to measure it. Where whether you realize or not, everybody contributes, or your activities contributes to the data footprint. Some, somebody somewhere is collecting those data for, for some purpose, right? And here is the example of the data um, that's in the healthcare and the clinical domain. Um, growing from the patient care, you have images, um, signals, um, um, text, you know, clinical notes, and uh, genomic sequences and at various sizes, various shapes. And uh, the estimation is that, uh, well, every two years, the, the footprint doubles. So this is an alarming rate. And, um, but how to cope with data and uh, how to derive um, value from data? This is a very nice report if you want to think about um, the transformation of data as an asset and driving value from data and what kind of disruptive and um, you know, progressive changes that one can make, whether it's a company or institute or healthcare entity. So these are the things that are all possible, you know, uh, but requires um, effort to make data um, usable and valuable. Um, so, you know, data is, uh, you know, one of the V's is speed. So I want to stop and pause for us to think about what data actually is. So what do you see on the slides? Are these data? Low level. Low level, right. If you want to generate data, you can use a random number and fire up all the Amazon machines to generate data, right? But, uh, but generate those numbers, right? But I wouldn't call, in this context, I wouldn't call that data. Um, these are numbers, not data. Um, what are the data, then? Data are values that at least have a type with it, of what kind of data is. is whether it's inches or pounds, um, what, what you can use to measure. It's outcome of something that we can observe or measure, right? Then that comes with unit. And then when you have that, that becomes data. And another distinction. Now we, we know what, you know, in my point of view, what data is. The question is then what's the information? You heard about the information and knowledge and things like that. Are these information then? Where if I give you, do you get any information from this? No, you don't get any information. So the information is um, actually data in context, in some context. So to be specific, you know, you see numbers 60, 175, 179, and then you see 60 inches, 179 pounds, and then you say John Smith is, is that tall and that heavy. That's, that becomes information if you relate to uh, entity and, and becomes an observ observation and a unit of fact. Right, so then moving forward to the scale of things in our conceptual level, um, then what is the knowledge? Knowledge, actually, there's no simple way to define knowledge, and we're not trying to define it. But pragmatically, knowledge is, uh, involves information uh, in reasoning, belief, uh, understanding, and action. So if we know uh, John Smith is 60 inches and 179 pounds, then we can calculate his BMI is 35. A BMI of 35 is quite obese, um, um, you know, according to health healthcare standards. And then um, he will be at risk of type 2 diabetes and other obesity-related healthcare questions, right? So this is a running example of how adding additional context gives us progression from data to information, then to knowledge. But we don't stop there. The, there's a DQ pyramid, what's called, data, information, knowledge, and wisdom pyramid. If and the last line here says diet and exercise can reduce obesity. 
This is, this is wisdom. This is not a specific knowledge. This is generated from a lot of knowledge in aggregate and then observing and distill something that where what you should do without any particular information or particular time. This is one, the, the principle based which you operate, right? So that becomes wisdom. So wisdom is principles distilled from knowledge in general. And uh, so what data science is um, about is this um, process of driving from very concrete elements, pieces of data, to relationships among those data. And then at higher level, it's actually patterns from those relations. Each level we progress, it's, it's connecting more things at a higher level. So the relation becomes one single dot in your next level of patterns, okay? So that's the way of, of thinking, uh, especially from computer science. If you're trained in computer science, you know, computational thinking very much involves these kind of levels of abstraction when we move forward. So um, big data, lost in it? Well, um, as, a, as Elena already you know, um, <coughs> described very well, big data is really not about data. It's about asking a bigger question and having a bigger vision. Uh, instead of thinking about this room, or your department, or your company, thinking about globally, everything, all the drivers in the world, what do they do, right? Think about that scale, then ask a big question. Can you fix such and such for all, right? What data you need? Then those kind of questions and those kind of vision will lead you to the kind of data you need. And you need to leverage all the data that's out there available, whether it's you know, collected, ready or not, or you need to um, capture it de novo. Um, that's the process of what big data actually uh, leads us to. So it's an inverse pyramid almost. Start with, uh, with wisdom and knowledge. Kind of, what kind of wisdom? What kind of knowledge do you want to gain? And then what kind of uh, data you need to collect? And what kind of information you need to generate? to facilitate that. Well, this is in the right uh, sequence of talks because we talked about <laughs> Chevron, the oil. Well, because of the value of the data, people actually, and also ubiquity of data, people have compared uh, data as new oil, right? Well, it can be refined and then can you know, uh, drive your car, you know, uh, generate electricity, and actually you know, we see everywhere you know, all the uh, biochemical products um, are derivatives of, of oil, crude oil from, right? So this is the process. There are similarities of oil and data, but there are distinctions. Data is really not the new oil because data can be replicated indefinitely number of times and you're not lose a bit, right? And also I just point out uh, one of the uh, Last item there is that uh, a little bit of data can be dangerous thing. It can generate bias. It can, uh, you know, if you're not careful, can violate security, privacy, and all of those regulatory kind of framework. And it can lead to wrong decision and can be costly, um, especially in the healthcare domain. So <laughs> uh, big data can be uh, really more than some of its parts. Where because of the the difference of oil and data. Data, the refinement process for data really involves this set of principles that's laid out in this publication by a few colleagues uh, who are working in the scientific management domain. It's called the fair data principle. If data can be replicated, reused, then what do you need to do to refine the data so that it can realize the potential value? You need to make data findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Each one of the aspects have specific uh, meanings to it, and I'm not going to go through the details of the individual items, but it's basically the idea that if one person, one lab, one company generates data, and if that data is to be shared, how can another person, another company, and, you know, another entity um, be able to interpret the data, reanalyze data, linking the data to a different, uh, in, in a different context and generate new insight 
and derive new value. And that's really much of the question. So data is a commodity, but th that commodity needs to be carefully curated um, for common goods. And the one of the curation process, and actually this is a process that um, I have been working and, and, and uh, be f uh, very familiar with is that the, you know, we have databases, but not all the databases are built the same. Some of the data are, um, you have values annotated with variables. Some are defined by data dictionaries that's local and specific to this study, to this team. And then we have the data elements that, that's commonly defined that can be reused across different studies, different projects. Like the BMI, you don't need to redefine BMI, right? And that's common data elements. And moving upwards, then you have specific codes and terminologies that if you use those, that's universally understood. Everybody, if you use this code, then everybody understands. In healthcare setting, the billing code uh, is uh, ICD, uh, CPT, those are uh, universally understood. And then um, ontologies. Ontologies not only talk about concepts, but also relations, uh, relationships, and they basically codify the kind of knowledge in a specific domain. Then we can reuse that knowledge. So knowledge in a certain form, basically it's, it's domain ontologies. That's, that's one kind of knowledge. And uh, one, when we start this process, you know, this is the metadata progression. From left to right, we're enriching data. We're linking data from the basic units to add in more context to be able to get generate information, easier to perform analytics, and then derive new knowledge in the end. And so, um, I want to pause, I, I, I promise to get, give some examples, particular examples in my group uh, related uh, to uh, data science informatics. Really, you know, when you talk about data, then who generates data? How gets data gets managed, integrated, and be ready for analytics and performing an analytics? These are some of the aspects of uh, what informatics do for data science in general and informaticians uh, are treating themselves as, as data scientists as well. Um, they just move things around. Um, but in terms of approach, um, the kind of tools and um, data assets created here, we're creating that uh, using what's called the inverse pyramid. So on the one hand, we generate data from, generate information from data, knowledge from information, and so on. But once we generate knowledge, whether that knowledge, where, wherever that is, if you can apply that knowledge in your process of collecting data, managing data, and generating information, why not use it? And using that is really um, uh, effective and important, uh, at least in my context. So here is our collection of tools ranging from data capture, data integration, query, um, a range of uh, tools that I'm gonna quickly mention as examples that uh, I have led and working with some of the students and faculty on, on, the, on the back of the uh, seats there. Um, so feel free to talk to them about specific uh, projects of interest as well. So this is one tool called uh, OPIC. This is, a, this is a tool to capture data um, in the epilepsy monitoring units. The idea here is to capture data um, as high of a quality as possible, basically um, addressing the data quality and semantic issue as upstream as possible, right? At the first time of collection, you get it right. Uh, there may be a little bit more effort, but once you've done that, then you eliminate much more kind of um, multitudes of additional effort in cleaning data, um, you know, converting from unstructured, structured, um, and linking data uh, with other resources and things like that. So um, this is a tool we developed and uh, it's in use and it has been uh, used in seven hospitals in uh, collecting data about 3,000 patients. And we're, 
we're still uh, growing this uh, patient population and making this tool uh, widely disseminatable. And um, the icon over there is just a um, simple um, indication that there's, there are uh, 65 million people in the world um, having epilepsy. Um, in the um, capturing uh, information education, we created uh, this tool uh, for surveying. It's, a, it's an extensive, long-term, uh, large survey uh, about oncology nurses on their attitude towards clinical trials, because clinical trial is very important in developing new therapeutics, new drugs, and things like that. Um, so, uh, but one of the bottleneck is that um, although nurses have the most encounter with uh, cancer patients, but they're not in a commanding position to bring up the topic of clinical trial. So this study, we surveyed um, where we sent invitation to the Oncology Nursing Society and have about 2,000 uh, surveys completed and randomly um, sort of branched out into um, those receiving video-based educational material and not, and perform ecological uh, moments kind of feedback to see whether those educational material made a change towards their attitude of a clinical trial. And to do this, we, we could have used a red cap, but it didn't have all the functionalities we, we, we wanted to have. And it's a large, really large, complex survey. So we implemented uh, using a reform tool developed uh, by ourselves. Um, another, so this is about Parkinson's disease. Parkinson's disease, um, patients have uncontrollable tremors. And if you implant a device in the brain, uh, it's just like pacemaker for the heart. You can control the tremor and a patient can uh, function normally. So, but the question is where and how, what kind of stimulation to apply? Um, how to program the device so that it continuously function uh, in a way it's intended. And uh, so collecting those kind of data, you really get much to get into the topic that was actually yesterday's keynote that you know, every patient um, enter into the health system, that information um, should be used to, uh, for the purpose of the next patient that's coming to the, to the healthcare system. Where this is where, but the question is how do you get, collect those data? And this is really data not, that's not usually collected, recorded. Uh, when you take care of uh, Parkinson's uh, patients. So we developed a system that actually captured the electrodes position, the side effects and benefits, and all of the granularity uh, in order to um, collect the kind of information that's needed to develop machine learning algorithms to inform better care uh, and see the patterns, whether it's surgery in com com combination of, of stimulation, uh, vice versa, and plus, uh, um, uh, other mechanisms, what's the best approach to, uh, to the next patient. And um, hospitals, uh, almost, uh, you know, more than 80% of U.S. hospitals have EMR system. And once you collected the, you know, uh, uh, health, um, electronic health records, you have large footprint of patients. And um, electronic data warehouse uh, is really um, about reusing that patient cohort and to perform um, different kinds of research, uh, per, uh, research projects. And the interface um, becomes an important issue um, in how to get the subgroup of patient in the way you want. And we develop the, the, uh, the data sphere, the system, um, to make that process easier. I re revisited this topic and just a little bit. Um, <laughs> Related to um, epilepsy, still we want to have curated um, signals of seizures so that people can readily visualize, perform analysis, and maybe share with, um, with different groups. This is really tra uh, transforming the data format from long time series data into minimum, minimum kind of units that's ported with its own metadata so that you can qu quickly reassemble in the way you want. That, be that makes the s signal data 
um, much more manageable and visualizable and anal analyzable. And this is an ongoing project. Uh, this is a, just the early stage. We're um, going to um, uh, use this approach and uh, ingest uh, um, epilepsy patients into this kind of um, platform and help um, um, study seizure patterns. And speaking of seizure patterns, the, this is really an unsolved problem of how to uh, detect seizure and, um, and actually predict seizure. Um, the challenges, um, um, one of the main challenges actually data is, can be very noisy in those settings. Imagine patient having seizure and then you're trying to re record the signal. So electrodes can get, get loose, there can be other artifacts, and how to really distill the useful information from those noisy contexts is really a challenge in, in deriving value from here. So, um, and then um, once you, so these are collection of tools that's involved in um, collecting data and visualizing data, uh, but then query and integration of the data is next uh, several tools um, gets into that uh, topic. Well, one is called XSearch. It's a search interface driven by a sleep domain ontology. 20% uh, of the US population don't have, uh, don't get enough sleep and actually have sleep disorders. And so sleep is important, but this is a resource, the front end of the resource that allows you to query what kind of sleep data are there that's available for you to perform a sleep-related study. And this is another tool developed by Xiaojing Li um, to perform automatic sleep uh, stage scoring. And sleep quality measurement, there's no you know, standardized way to, to perform that, and it's, it's actually questionnaire, um, you know, quanti qualitative kind of based. So the kind, this, this kind of tool allows you to really extract um, biomarkers, sleep biomarkers information to understand this, you know, what kind of sleep stage the patient had and really di uh, perform proper diagnosis of the sleep quality and, and things like that. Um, uh, this is the core interface for epilepsy data. Once we collected the epilep data, multibondality data from uh, epilepsy, epilepsy patients, then we'll, be, we'll need to be able to uh, query that data, explore that data, and um, create cases and controls um, and to perform um, um, research and analysis. Um, this is another interface we, we're um, developing, which is um, to, to provide better, um, more usable interface to access um, cancer register data. And this is really by, um, this is by converting um, NCI thesaurus, which is a terminology system dedicated to, uh, for cancer, uh, but making that serving an interface role so that you interact with uh, this familiar kind of terminologies and concepts, but when, as you drill down, you, you actually get to the kind of information you sub -co uh, cohort, subpopulation of interest you, you're interested in. So um, these are tools, a quick uh, you know, review, uh, review of the tools and um, developing my group. And uh, I want to also highlight two of the resources, um, data resources that has been used by um, people um, uh, beyond our group uh, for, um, for um, research studies. One of this tool is um, related to sleep. Um, again, sleep, um, is important, and uh, if you don't have uh, good quality sleep, um, you have long-term health um, problems. It'll, it'll develop, uh, whether it's um, diabetes, dementia, obesity, obesity, and AD, and things like that. That's really, um, basically, our health and well-being is uh, grounded on good quality sleep uh, regular, regularly. I, and so because of this importance, um, NIH, NHLBI in particular, has funded uh, a number, a large number of epidemiological uh, studies and clinical trials. So over time, those um, projects uh, collected large 
amount of data about patients, their polysonograms, their sleep signals um, uh, overnight in the hospital, and um, all of their um, clinical uh, comorbidities, what kind of conditions they have, their demographics, and, and things like that. So uh, each number there is really the number of participants for that particular study, whether it's for um, uh, heart disease or for dementia and things like that. that. So we have uh, quite a lot of, uh, you know, a dozen those large-scale studies that the data is al already there. The original investigators who performed the study have those data somewhere. But the purpose of the, um, for us is really to collect all the, integrate all of those data in one setting so that if a new generation of researcher wants to reanalyze data, asking a different question, asking a bigger question, they can readily access and reuse this data for their research. You can imagine, you know, these studies, each of the individual studies are performed at different uh, settings, different departments, different labs, and uh, at different times. And, and integrating, harmonizing this data is really a tall order, and it's really, uh, I would say, one of the most challenging aspects for data scientists, right? How do you refine this big data oil, right? And, and um, that's the work we do, and this is actually uh, the um, architecture diagram for this project uh, and moving the data from different cohorts using ontology-guided approach to harmonize data and making it accessible and uh, um, uh, reusable. And so the, we were fortunate to be funded by the um, NIH for, um, as a national sleep research resource and uh, so currently we have uh, more than 10 such cohorts integrated, about 27,000 subjects uh, in, this, uh, in this registry, and 30,000 files uh, in the standard format, and uh, we're generating usage. Um, uh, the total data footprint is four terabytes, but we, um, people around the world already downloaded 282 terabytes. So that's the throughput of the downloading volume. And so you can go to this, this is a live site, you can go there and browse um, what's available, what kind of data is available, what kind of tools that people already share to perform analysis uh, and uh, request uh, those data. And um, this is really, really um, uh, one of the uh, rich uh, sleep data um, resources that's ready for you to take advantage of um, anybody here. So moving from sleep to epilepsy, these are all neurological related. Um, epilepsy is a common serious neurological disorder, but I want to mention one of the serious um, phenomena uh, in epilepsy is, is called sudden unexpected death. And if you want to perform research on sudden unexpected death, how do you go about it? So this is really a, a question, right? Because the diagnosis of SUDAP is death. And if a person is dead and you collect uh, what from, from the person, right? So it's really hard. So the strategy is actually not wait for a person to get SUDAP because you don't know uh, who and when and uh, you know, what setting. It's impossible to collect data after the diagnosis, unlike diabetes. If your diagnosis with diabetes, you still have a long life ahead of you, right? You can monitor glucose and exercise and you know, monitor the disease uh, progression. But for SUDAP, the definition is death. So you cannot wait under diagnosis to collect data. And so the strategy for, um, for us uh, in this setting is really collecting comprehensive data ahead of time for a population at a high risk. Those are the people who come to the epilepsy monitoring units, have uncontrolled uh, uh, refractory and di uh, uh, epilepsy, and uh, uh, monitored from there. So the, um, this, this um, question, this kind of challenge, motivated us um, about this um, 
uh, center, epilepsy center result was. And the one place, if you have a single hospital, single epilepsy monitor unit, for a year, you may have one or two. It's not enough of the suit up cases to power your study. Uh, so it's imperative for multiple sites to work together to collect data on those patients at high risk. And then hopefully uh, we can have data um, for, to perform analysis. Uh, not only um, from patient to patient, you know, using uh, single data, uh, clinical data, but also um, the center is set up in such a way that we have basic scientists, mouse model people, working side by side with clinicians who interact with human. And so the, the idea is whatever question, phenomena that uh, can be discovered from the human side on the bad side, whether that's observable and translatable in the, uh, in the bench side, the, in the lab. And for a mouse, you can perform whatever experiment you, you want and then be able to then translate that discovery back to the bad side. This is re really very much of the idea. Um, so this is involving some of the major um, stakeholders, institutions are highlighted there, and we have uh, this large uh, collaboration, and this really gets to the message of the Alina's, um, you know, communication is the key. You know, communication actually uh, at many different levels in terms of understanding what other people are, are trying to say, right? What they desire, what are the needs, um, and what are the challenges. Um, so this is a collaboration is really the key to uh, move the needle uh, in the suit up domain. And um, from the informatics point of view, this is the architecture again. This is another architecture on collecting de data de novo using the OPIC tool that I already mentioned earlier, and then moving into a staging area using, a, uh, we don't need to reinvent tools that works well, uh, that's, uh, that's almost the standard in, in the industry. Persist is a way to visualize data um, in epilepsy monitoring unit, convert that into uh, standardized format, uh, European data format, EDF. And then once it's converted to EDF, where the medicine system actually links patient information to not only the EEG data, but also blood chemistry, genome sequences, MR imaging, all of the data are available at for query and exploration. And this is a resource that's, that's been redeployed at UT Health after I moved here about half a um, half year ago. So this is the Medicis query interface, and there's a publication <coughs> describing uh, that in more detail if you're interested in, in uh, looking more into it. And this is the data management system because of the complexity uh, and, and data flow from different sites and different data stages. We needed to develop a dedicated interface to monitor the data um, uh, uploading acquisition process. Um, and so I've talked about the data capturing. I've talked about uh, data integration. But if you look at it, whether, so I want to switch gears on the last 10 minutes on the topic of what's in the printed abstract. I changed, uh, you know, broadened my, uh, my scope a little bit, really. Um, so we have data on the one hand, whether it's big or small, right? We have human. And cancer registry, uh, sleep resource, uh, suit of data, whatever you mention it. <clears throat> so really what stands between you and infinite amounts of data back there, you can perceive, is really a limited screen. You look at your cell phone, right? It's really limited. You look at your laptop, it's a little larger, but it's still limited, confined, real estate. And through that, you need to right, look into data, try to see what's there, right, and visualize. It really uh, becomes a bottleneck how we take advantage of this really limited uh, space. That's a bottleneck. And the bottleneck has been addressed in, um, in you know, consumer kind of setting, um, uh, like Amazon, very well, very efficiently, because that's how you can shop online, you know, without uh, too much effort, uh, right? And you can shop for shoes um, and get the right kind of shoes you want, because there's a facet 
that's already built into the, the interfaces. The facets include the size, you know, what, what is the size you want? What's the color? What's the price range? What's the make of those? And this facet is actually uh, the handle. I, we call it semantic handle. Allows you to link uh, the conceptual kind of, uh, you know, um, <coughs> attributes into uh, real world kind of entities, and in, in this case, shoes. So if we want to address the interface problem using a similar approach, what stands uh, here is where we have the patient population. Now, patients are not shoes, right? You can't say you have this size and this color and then that's it, and you get all the patients. The disease variety, the medication, the diagnosis, the procedure, and all of that, there, there's millions of variations and combinations there. It's very hard to just build, let's say, create a facet to search for patients, right? But what do you do? Well, fortunately, we, most of the information is already annotated or can be readily or with some effort annotated using higher kind of metadata, higher level metadata, whether it's terminologies or ontologies. So here, we, we can think of a scaffolding built on top. So the patients are actually fitting into different hierarchies in your ontological and terminological hierarchy in, in each of the case. And we can turn that our, around and treat that as facets and sub-facets and convert it that way. Uh, in that way, as you navigate the ontological hierarchy, which is where, by definition, more familiar to our conceptual understanding, once you expand that, you get gets refining, you're basically refining your exploration and narrowing down and uh, gets the subpopulation you want. So, so the, the challenge is how does the big ontology having you know, millions of terms fit into this limited space of uh, where you originally had the facets uh, in shopping for shoes? And that's the interface challenge. And, and that's the challenge um, that we need to develop systematic ways to convert uh, this is the way to convert NCI thesaurus into kind of facet and sub-facets and continually be able to expand and drill it on to the, uh, to the place uh, the uh, uh, user wants. And really, once you turn the ontological systems around, it was not originally designed for this interface purpose. But if you do now, for this kind of purpose, you have basic questions that needs to be asked, basic properties that needs to be satisfied to fulfill this new role. And that includes a soundness, where if you can imagine the ontological structure as a big net and you drill it on, it's basically you closing your fish net, you wanna make sure, two things. One is that once you close the net, you're not letting any fish go away, right? That's one thing. And also, once you tighten the net enough in the end, you want to make sure no foreign objects like a fish or shark goes, or a shark is a fish <laughs> anyway, but those kind of different um, um, foreign objects, not your intention that go into the net. Basically, those are the properties of soundness and completeness. Fish net does not miss any fish, that's complete. Fish net only catch fish, that's soundness. We want to make sure these properties. And where, why do we want to make sure this property? Intuitively, there's a very tight link between those properties and your, the performance of your query or search. It immediately affects your precision and recall, okay? If you basically incomplete facets reduce recall, and some facets reduce precision. And uh, here's the example in CIS source. I won't go into details, but you now can ask, are those terminology systems fulfilling the purpose of soundness and completeness for the interface uh, role. Uh, the question is, for the most part they do, but in some aspects, non-trivial ones, they don't. And, and you say, why, right? So this is really ontology, related ontology quality analysis uh, kind of topic. And this is a research area very dear to my mind, uh, to my heart. Um, for that matter. Um, <clears throat> so it's hunting for those kind of defects in the ontological systems that actually turn out not only they are not good fit for the interface, they are quality issues in themselves. 
um, that needs to be addressed. And one of the method, the mathematical method, um, turning into computer science and mathematics, is the, what's called FCA, former concept analysis. We can turn that former concept analysis theory around into uh, ontology curation principle. And we apply that to uh, improve the speed, because we need to do exhaustive analysis, or applying it to uh, different settings, whether it's SNOMAD, gene ontology, and thesaurus. Here's a um, collection of uh, <coughs> um, papers um, reporting the progress on that. And getting back to faceted search, and the, the kind of uh, tools I mentioned earlier, X-Search, Metasys, those are really built around the idea of faceted search. It's only that in those specialized domains, your ontological systems are not that large and not that complex, so that we can build those tools without too much fanfare. But when it gets to the um, um, ED, you know, large patient population, uh, then that becomes a, a, a challenge, and then that invokes the whole kind of quality research and improved interface performance and, and things like that. So that's for data resource. I want to turn because I sit in the you know UT Health. Um, actually, my office is two streets uh, on the other side. Um, I'm a computer scientist, uh, you know, sitting right in the center of uh, TMC, basically. Uh, but I can't ignore those uh, healthcare and clinical questions as a data scientist. There, there's a lot of opportunity, tremendous amount of opportunities we can, as a data scientist, a computer scientist, information we can do to impact um, both the quality of care, the, uh, the doctor's um, interaction experience with the EMR system, you know, the burning, uh, you know, burnout of physicians really has to do with um, too much effort uh, that they need to spend interacting, uh, struggling uh, with the EMR system. Um, so there are all of those um, um, non-exhaustive list of opportunities one can um, make a difference in the setting. And one of the um, ongoing projects, uh, still on, actively ongoing, is to create basically the EMR domain-specific EMR for epilepsy. If we want to design uh, such kind of EMR centered on the um, physician experience, what would, we, what would it take, what it looks like? We have made progress in that domain, and this is the overall kind of uh, functional block diagram. I wouldn't go into detail, but in the end, we don't forget about patients. It's really how to um, uh, make the assessment of patient conditions when they're in the hospital much easier, um, almost effortless, you know, in terms of whether the condition becomes better or worse, what kind of medication, and, and things like that. So this is uh, really a call to action using specific examples. Uh, it's not too late. You, know, you already heard about the data science, big data, for probably you know, five years, 10 years. Uh, but we have, to my mind, there's not enough innovation, not enough disruption, because there's too much of X as a service. So it's like AI as a service, right? Everything commoditized. That sort of downplays the kind of innovation and the disruption that's really needed to make a difference in this domain. So I conclude with acknowledgement for collaborators and funding sources. and. Uh, we're hiring, and also there are posters uh, in the following up uh, session that uh, you know, be happy to talk to you um, about, about any topic that I uh, mentioned. Let's thank our speaker. <laughs> let's, let's see here if we... I think we can take a couple of quick questions while we maybe get set up with the laptop. Uh, any questions? I do have a question, actually. So uh, one of the things you're doing, you're actually in now partially you're building software systems and deploying them. You're now in the business of being a software provider for running these trials. Uh, is that sort of limiting the sort of the clinical research and, and the, the research to supporting the clinical remission, or you know what, what's the sustainability of that? That's a great question. Sustainability is really very much of an issue that's uh, that's in the in this uh, informatics domain. And the, the, our objective here is to, through first-hand first -hand interaction, to create the systems 
in such a way so that it stabilizes. And, and at that point, we want to pass around to a vendor, to a private startup company or, or a larger company who wants to buy it and then take off from there. But it's really demonstrating the kind of possibilities we can have. So that's why we don't have a single tool. We have you know, 20, 30 tools on different levels of the pipeline ready to be activated at uh, different stages and off the shelf, uh, as, so to speak. Uh, that's a desirable state. Thanks. Okay.